right, everybody, welcome again to RX Fault. I'm here with Scott Brown, an artist and professional photographer who has analyzed UFO video and photos for many years. He's co-founder of a group called In the Field, or ITF, a global group that shares methods and data in studying events and sightings. He's also the producer of a documentary called Catalyst of the Hunt. I'll link to all of these things below on the channel. Uh, check it out. It's a really interesting video. And in 2019, he was featured in Diana Pasuko's best-selling book, American Cosmic. So two of the things we're going to get into tonight are just his personal encounters. We'll go into all kinds of stuff, and there's, there's a lot of things on his web pages. But his personal encounters as a boy, which may have driven his interest, maybe obsession with getting to the bottom of the UFO phenomena. And also he's linked a paper that I think is incredibly fascinating of the Jack Filet Nolan paper, um, which is one of the most fi fascinating scientific pieces of evidence I've seen. So I want to, I found, I didn't know about it until I saw it on his page, but it's, it's really, really interesting. So, Hey Scott, welcome to the show. Hey Kevin, thanks for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so we'll, we'll go as long, we'll go, we'll take the conversation anywhere you want. Um, but, I really would first want to know about this in the field. What is the, what is it that you guys are doing? What's the goal there? So uh, it started as um, right around 2013. Well, I guess a little bit before that, I be, I just began to notice that there was a lot of people online in different parts of the world that were shooting, you know, with infrared and with um, full spectrum cameras and cameras hooked up to telescopes and, you know, and they were capturing stuff on a regular basis. Um, and by that, I don't mean like every day, but on a regular basis. Um, so my goal was to bring all of these people together and begin to, you know, uh, post our footage, take a look at it, um, try to try to debunk it, try to figure out what it is, uh, um, you know, take note of the characteristics of its movement, um, uh, its, its look, you know, due to its brand of camera or, um, you know, the lens that it's going through. So long story short, um, I formed the group on Facebook and I began to pull people in from all around the world. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, it was really good. There was a lot of people that went out there and did that. Um, it seems as though that that has dropped off. There's not a lot of people that dedicate themselves to it. Um, you know, there's people that sky watch and they love to watch the shooting stars and, the you know different uh events that happen in the sky but there's not a lot of people that go out with equipment to try to capture some type of anomaly or anomalistic behavior um so uh yeah that's how the group started and i began to to pull people in and we began to post our footage and look at it and discuss it and like I said, it's, it's slowed down now, but it used to be very, very, uh, you know, a lot of activity. There's just a lot of people that have kind of slowed down. They're not doing it. Uh, some people, and, th and this is a, this is a weird thing, just real fast. Um, it seems as though if, if someone has some anomalistic behavior and they're videotaping it. Sp different people in the group have, you know, filmed things and then all of a sudden it kind of dries up and comes to a dead stop for, for that person. <clears throat> so in other words, they can't, once they get good video, they aren't able to get anymore or they it, it just seems to be the activity fades off. Okay almost as if eat oh okay well it's recognizing that i'm recording it and it kind of fades off hmm. you could you could assume that or speculate about it but yeah. it it seems like it's a 
it's a behavior of it. That's really interesting that you say that. And I, I think maybe I'm going to want to come back to that a little bit later again in more detail if you're willing to. Just because I, now I myself am not uh, a long time. I'm not an expert at all in this phenomena or that. It just is to me, it was just something that was interested. I was interested in it as a kid. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but I take a scientific approach, which I think you do too. But in, in the sense that I've always liked science and I want to be skeptical and know that what I'm looking at. So, but it was curious when I've talked to some of the people I've already spoken with that they feel that, that the phenomena is showing it, it knows it's being observed. And it, one of the guys that I talked to seem, believes, and he's, uh, you know, followed this stuff very closely, that it's showing itself to you on purpose. Not just that it's aware that it's being observed, that it's actually showing itself to you. Like there's some kind of a connection there. Yeah, well, so with some researchers, the saying goes, uh, once you become aware of the phenomena, it becomes aware of you. And this is a play on the old, and I and don't it, I don't have the quote correct, but it's uh, something like once you stare into the abyss, it stares back at you. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a play on that, but. Uh, a, a lot of researchers say that, you know, that once you recognize it, it recognizes you. Yeah. You know? I, th I think it's an interesting part of the phenomenon because obviously you can interpret it in different ways. And sometimes it could just be somebody happened to catch something once or experience something once. And what are the odds of them experiencing it again? But the idea of a connection goes into the guy, you know, the possibility that this phenomena is not is more than just nuts and bolts, you know, craft carrying aliens that have arrived from some different system to our own for their own purposes, whether it's to study or they're traveling through or whatever. Whereas if you if there's a more of an of an interaction between humans and whatever is going on here, is this related to is this a you know, is this something that reflects human consciousness? Um uh, you know, is it something that's just trying to, in, is it something that's outside that's trying to interact with human consciousness? Is it something that comes from within us that manifests outside? Uh, you know, as um, the famous psychologist Carl Jung published the whole, his last book was on that, um, suggesting that kind of thing. So I, that part is always definitely interesting me. So um, I, I definitely, anytime you have any thoughts on that, just jump right back into that. Yeah, it's a, uh, uh, it, it's a, uh... I mean, there, there's some researchers that are, I've almost felt that it's happened to me too. So I have this story and there's a video on my YouTube page. So I, this is, this is a couple of months after I get my first um, night vision camera and it's a, a recon 550, I believe shoots in black and white you can flip it to green or red um yeah. and and not that powerful you know uh yeah. and i and i i took it out and i began to scan off of the porch it's about three o'clock in the morning pitch black out you know town silent i live in a small town and i'm scanning and as I come up above the trees, there's five balls about the size of a basketball or a soccer ball doing this. So I, I was, I was shocked for a minute. I was like, what, you know, I'm, I'm trying to rationalize, like, what is that? At first I'm thinking it's insects like close to the camera, but then I'm looking and no, it's way out over those trees. So I, uh, I, I fumble with the camera because I'm just learning how to use this camera. I just got it. So I begin to fumble with the buttons to try to figure out how to record. I hit the record button, swing the camera back up, and all five disperse in both directions horizontally. So as right as you hit record. Yeah, but as I swung the camera up, I'm seeing this 
happen without the viewfinder uh, close to my face so I can see it through the camera. And then as I hit record, I catch two and there's two tall pine trees and they go directly behind it and stop right behind it as if they're hiding behind it. And then one drifts out from the side and slowly comes down the side of the tree and then takes off. So I'm scanning the sky again, trying to see where it went. And maybe 30 seconds goes by and two of them that were hiding behind something else take off in that same direction. And I caught both of those on video too. Um, so, you know, not what, to what do it, birds look like? Not, what, what would birds look like under infrared or bats or something similar to that? How would that look under the infrared? Depending on the, the resolution of the camera and how much detail it can pick up, you can literally see their wings flapping. You, yeah. you can see it. Um, but uh, if it's poor resolution, it's at a distance, it'll create orbs. You won't be able to see the detail of the wing flapping. It'll just look like an orb. So a lot of people get mistaken with that stuff. Um, so could that have been birds? Because no. it was far enough. It was behind the tree line, right? So it was, you could probably estimate the distance a little bit. Yeah, I don't believe it was birds at all. I just don't. Um, when you see it on camera, you can see that it's, I don't know. It just seemed, I got the impression that it knew that I was filming it. Yeah. And it went and hid behind the tree. Right. No, I hear you. I'm just trying to rule out all, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. To convince I, people, you have to be able to, even to convince yourself, really, you have to be able to. Right. And right. I think that was the purpose. That is the purpose of your group ITF is to try to eliminate some of those possibilities. Yeah. So you can narrow it down to the, um, I, I don't know. I've, I've heard of this infrared. I've, I remember hearing them talk about this on the old Art Bell show and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I've seen some of the videos posted. So, but I don't really know. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a technical person, so I don't know what birds would look like if they were behind the tree line at three o'clock in the morning or, that presumably that's way too far for insects so it would have to be birds or bats or something some kind of object right so right. yeah yeah so so it's uh you know it it pointing to this other second incident where i got the same feeling this video's online as well i'm scanning again and as i'm going over the rooftops something comes straight down in the viewfinder and remember i'm not recording and yeah. it comes down hits the roof and comes to a dead stop so as i keep scanning i think about it for a second and i thought was that a leaf like i automatically thought it was a leaf that fell to the but then i thought why is the infrared picking it up and why is it giving off some type of glow it doesn't make sense so as i swing back to the roof I hit record and it's just a perfect orb and it's sitting there on the roof. Then it slowly drifts towards the edge of the roof and then it bursts in a, like a slow motion starburst. Huh. And the whole thing was caught on video. I Birds don't do that. <laughs> no, no. And I, and I got that same impression that it knew that I was watching it. So it's demonstrating for you, basically. Yeah, it's like, you know, and now the activity, again, like others, has almost come to a dead stop. Yeah. Like, I can go out and look all the time. I'll catch something every so often. Maybe it's anomalous, but not like before. The one, I know the, the videos that I've seen in the past of this infrared sky watching, those ones seem to show... And they seem to think they were tracking an alternative space program or something with outside, but that was way up in the upper atmosphere. So you're talking about things that were down at our level. Yeah. Um, have you seen anything unusual? Like, I don't, maybe your camera wasn't powerful enough. I don't no, know. So there there's, it goes all the way up to a gen three, which is like military grade 
Um, so there's this guy down in Australia, his name is UFO Lou, everybody calls him. I've never talked to him. I've tried, sent him messages, but he's very to himself. Yeah. Um, so he sets his camera up. He has a powerful tube. Uh, he shoots in Gen 3 and he points it just at a section of the sky and he'll let it run. And this guy has caught some wild stuff, like objects coming in that do a complete, you know, 45 degree turn, 90 degree turn, whatever, on a dime and go in a different direction. Yeah. Um, you know, just stuff that's just not normal. It's just not normal. It doesn't match satellites, aircraft, you know, it's, it just doesn't. Um, but again, it, if you film and you get out there, it's very fleeting. It's very, very, uh, you know, you, you, you sit, you could sit out there for a thousand hours and, and videotape and not get a thing. And then all of a sudden one night, boom, it shows up or you don't have a camera and it shows up <laughs> and you're <Yeah>. pissed, <laughs> you know? So how would you, how, how would, do you have any theories on how, like, so if you just took that on the, on the face value of it, that you have a phenomena that not, not only knows it's being watched, but seems it wants to be watched, but doesn't want to be recorded or doesn't want to be recorded regularly. How would you interpret that? Does that give you a clue as to what might be going on? So here's my feeling about it after all these years. Um, first, I feel that whatever is behind it, the intelligence behind it is indifferent to us. It doesn't matter if we're, you know. But it doesn't want to be recorded. So no, it's not no, indifferent. No. But but I don't think, I think to us, you know, it, it's, I don't believe in like, it's, it's, uh, uh, I forgot how you put it, benevolent or malevolent. Yeah, it's, well, no, right. It's kind of in the middle, and it's not really that way. And then uh, I think that we catch glimpses of it by accident. I, I don't think that, you know, that's why it doesn't come near. That's why we don't have anything that's near, and it always stays at a distance. Anyone that catches anything, it's at a distance. It never comes you know, it stays back there. I mean, but it, it, doesn't it seem to you like, for instance, that's in your own example there, the object that came down to your roof and waited there, and then when you picked it up again, moved a little bit and then went into a starburst, doesn't that seem more like it was trying to show you something? It was. It doesn't seem indifferent. It may, now, whether it's malevolent, benevolent, or somewhere in between is another another thing. It may have its own agenda. It may have its own reason for do for wanting, but it right, doesn't right, seem right. indifferent. It seems to be aware. It wanted you. It wanted you to. It was. It wanted you to see something. I think. Uh, I I think that there's influence behind it. That that. Um, you know, maybe it was re reinforcing what. I had already been shown or I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I think that's a, that's a really good um, possibility. In fact, so this is why I say maybe we should come back to this. Um, if you're still enjoying the conversation, because I think we want to want to hear a little bit about your personal story, which I've heard in the documentary, but I think it's really interesting. And it, it maybe gives an indication or kind of feeds what you're talking about here and what giving possible clues. So, so why don't we, we um, what do you think it's best to go chronologically from your first experience as a child, which you didn't remember till years later, I think, right? Or however you want to approach it. Right. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, the documentary that I sent you. So kind of a shortened version. Uh, 1987, I'm living in an apartment with my first wife. Um, I fall asleep with my face facing the back of the couch. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I end up having what some people call sleep paralysis, um, which I knew nothing about at the time. I didn't know what the hell that was. I didn't even know there was a name for it. Yeah. Uh, 
sensing something in the room near me, um, getting this really just dreadful feeling, you know, about this situation, uh, snapping out of it, you know, flipping on all the lights, freaking out. Um, and then approximately two weeks later, it happened a second time. And uh, this time I snapped out of it. I, I told my wife, you know, I think this place is haunted. And she said, why? And I, I told her and she goes, oh, you probably just had a bad dream, you know. <clears throat> she kind of convinced me that I had a bad dream. The only problem was the dreadful feeling stayed with me. So I kind of realized after a while that <clears throat> it wasn't a dream, that something did happen. Um, you know, growing up being a kid, I was a fan of horror films. You know, I had my share of nightmares as a kid and watched scary movies. This was not like that. This was like something that was like, gave me this really, really bad vibe. <laughs> and uh, so some time goes on after that. I walk into a store, there's a, I'm reading a bunch of biographies. I look up, there's a book called Out There by Howard Blum. I pull it out, check it out. What the hell? I'll give it a run. Sounds interesting. That was it. I, I began to consume everything I could get my hands on. Um, and this sparked different memories in my early life that I thought, you know, wait a minute, because the as I would come across uh, events and different things in the literature, it began to spark these things from the past that never really stood out before, but now they're really starting to stand out. And I thought, you know, is it connected? I don't know, you know, I have no idea. So uh, the one of the first, big ones was um, the disappearance of uh, of me <laughs> out of our family home. Um, my father was a police officer. They had the whole neighborhood searching for me. Um, they found me a couple hours later wandering up out of a field, claiming I was talking to horses when they were cows. Um, and uh, it wouldn't have been so significant if my mother, because I had no memories of it, but as I grew, my mother would tell this story over and over again. She wrote about it in her diary. Um, so you, were, you were how old? Four, you said? or Yeah, around four years old. Yeah. Um, because the reason I ask is so the lack of memory at that age could be just you didn't quite remember far back enough. Because, you know, obviously there's people in this in this particular field that there's lost time and things where, where in theory, if you're being abducted, they're wiping your memories. Right. So, right. so here this could be that they wiped your memory or it also could be that you were just too young. Right. Right. Um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, the, the, the part that made it all stand out to my mother and my father um, was that the house was dead bolted from the inside. So I was very small. I wasn't able to reach that. So they never figured out how you got out. Yeah. Yeah. They couldn't solve how I got out of the house. So it was kind of like laughed about like yeah. year, years later, my mom would say, you know, what are you going to disappear? You know, just make jokes out of it. And uh, I think it was because it was unsettling. It is. It, so it was the middle of the night. Everybody was sleeping and then you and they woke up and you were gone. Or It was early in the morning, like right before the sun would rise. Yeah. And then as they got up and the sun began to come up, they realized that I was missing. So you could have been out there for a long time, though. They're not sure what time you went out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I've thought I mean, about that, too. I mean, it is unusual for a four year old to leave their house. Yes. I mean, for any reason, right? It's like not yeah. something. Yeah. yeah. And then it, then it happened again. Um, and uh, 
that's another weird thing is that in in the research and over the years everything came in sets of two hmm. so the two incidents at the house the two episodes of sleep paralysis was the second episode the same thing you left in the middle of the night and they found you in the morning same blueprint same thing how much later in time was but it? the second time they found me at my parents best friend's house which was like two houses down instead of like the first time farther down the road down the hill into the woods with like a little small pasture with a fence and uh so so you went to two different places so it's not like there was like, for instance, let's say there was something that your four-year-old mind was transfixed on, such as seeing the cows or seeing the horses. But that's not the case, because in one case, you went to the woods in a field, and the other case, you went to a house. Right. So, um, or at least or at least that's where you were found. Uh, and how, how far apart were those incidents? Uh, from what she has always said, it was like months apart. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like maybe spring and then late summer or something like that. And you would think after the first one too, they would make sure the house was bolted up. So you... Yeah. Uh, uh, I think my mom was more uh, flabbergasted by it than my father was. Yeah. You know? He just thought it was a fluke thing, but um you know, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But so these, so the literature led me to all of these things from my past. Um, and then I began to clearly see different high strangeness around me, um, different events, noises, knocks, things being moved, um, you know, and, and, and you don't always you know, some people don't make that connection. They don't say, you know, oh, this is part of that phenomena. They'll they'll think it's, you know, something else like, oh, this is poltergeist or, you know, um, for me, it seems like it's all tied together somehow. Like, I don't know how, but. Yeah, it, it does seem likely because if there is a certain, let's say there's a certain amount of strangeness in the world you know we all know there's bigfoot block nest this and that some let's say but let's say some of these things turn out to be real so poltergeists are extremely rare but maybe real and alien counters and abductions are extremely rare but maybe real what are the odds of the same person getting hit by the same by not by the same but by strange things it, it, it would be against the odds unless they were connected right right so that make that makes sense yeah i agree <laughs> So again, it brings me back to that, and I and I want to. You mentioned a really good story on your channel about your brother, something that he had witnessed too. But I want to go back to again, give you a chance to maybe think again about um, the, what this phenomena is, because that's another clue there. If you're getting, or it could be a clue, right? The fact that it doesn't seem indifferent to you if you're getting knocks and and uh, uh, you know strange things going on, unless it's just somehow your mind is creating that um it seems like something is trying to communicate or they may that's probably too simplistic a way of looking at it but there's some connection that's personal to make a connection yeah something trying to reach out to make a connection yeah yeah you know i don't know it's it's i'm, I'm torn between that and i mean maybe we're not really meant to know what it what it is you know we've noticed it it's in our world yeah we're beginning to see that it's been around for a long long time yeah i think it's been around since before we were here probably and um you know i mean is it there to it seems to me and i've always had this feeling that there's some type of symbiotic relationship that we have with it, mm -hmm. but I can't say what that is. I can't right. say, you know, that, that, you know, it's after this or we're after that. It's, it's some kind of like interconnected relationship 
that's there for a reason. Um, that, it, that does that does seem to be that seems to me to me the most likely con, you know or at least logical conclusion based on the the nature of this kind of phenomena where it does and even just like when I talk about the conscious connection, I think about we have a couple of dogs and you know we look at them and, and how they look out the window and the world that they perceive is so different than the world that we perceive. And sometimes, sometimes you understand, they see someone walking a dog and they bark and you say, but other times I'm like, they're not perceiving this the same way. And it's not just a matter of their eyes don't take it in. Their, their minds are so different than ours, but even, but yet they are uh, mammals that have evolved to be very closely related to us. Um, you know, because they're basically connected to human beings. So if you think if there was another type of conscious entity that was either from another part of the universe or connected through a different plane of reality or something like that, it's not just that would we be, could sit there and say, what do they want in trying to communicate with you? Because they may be having the same trouble. They're trying to understand, you know, their level of consciousness is just so alien to ours that there's a connection, but it's not like they have all the answers and we can't figure it out. They may be as mystified as well, right? Um, True. It's just, you're trying to have that two such alien consciousness trying, you know. Um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I don't know. Just it's an interesting. I did see that um, you, you guys use the word sky fishing. I had never heard that before. I like that, though. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly who came up with that. Um, one of the people in the group uh, came up with it. And then, you know, it, it's, it's a continuously being modified. Um, you can, you can experiment with it and do, you know, whatever, Yeah. but, but we all kind of keep it underneath the, you know, the top title of sky fishing and then explain our method. Like for instance, I have one where I'm using a mirror in one of my videos where I'm reflecting out into the sky, mm -hmm. you know, to try to get that beam of light. Um, and, um, you know, just different ways. I mean, I, what does I, that do? I, what is, I'm, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I don't understand. What does that do? What's the purpose there? So the mirror was used in one of my videos. So what happened was I had a friend of mine that was using this method. So he would take a mirror, mm -hmm and get underneath the roof of a, of a overhang porch that's coming off of a house, mm -hmm. take the sun and take the beam. So you've got it on the roof underneath the porch and then drop it off the roof. So the beam goes out into the sky and then just flash back and forth, mm. back and forth off of the, the roof itself. So what would be the hope there that you're trying to do? You're trying to attract something by using the beam out into the sky. You're sending a signal up. All right. Yeah. And hoping, and hoping about, to catch it. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, um, I had success with it and, and so did a few other people. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, was it trying to send a signal back? I don't know. I mean, you can, you can see the video for yourself, but so that's one method. And then there's another method where um, the photo that I caught that was used in American Cosmic, the photo was printed in the book. Um, this is a method where I take the camera, set it on a tripod, point it in a locked fixed location on the sky and just random rapid fire the, the shutter and just boom, 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 boom move the camera to a different spot boom 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 then the work comes you've got to go through all the photos you've got to you know scrape through the video for hours and hours and see if you've got anything um mm -hmm. and in this sequence of photos uh i believe there was 30 something taken and in the middle of the sequence was this one photo where this object showed up, uh, you know, uh, ruling out uh, birds, planes, mm -hmm. um, balloons. And the, the way you can do this is that 
the button was rapid fired. So if any of those type of things were moving through, they would have been through the sequence of photos. Mm -hmm. Whereas this object showed up in one photograph. That was it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, does that mean something? I don't know. Um, yeah. But, but I caught it and I almost missed it because I had to zoom in on it yeah. to, to, to see it. I almost went past it and missed it. Um, and I've made that mistake a few times where I've not looked at my material close enough, went back, did a second look and went, oh, wait a minute, there is something mm -hmm. there, you know. Um, so, yeah, sky fishing. I mean, you can, you know, modify it. There's no rules. Yeah. You know, we just need an explanation about how you did it. Well, there, there is one of the interesting things you mentioned in one of your videos, maybe in that documentary, um, maybe comes to mind with this mirror method here, too. You mentioned the possibility that these things might be biological. And I think what you meant by that was not that there are biological entities on a craft, but that these objects themselves might be biological entities themselves, which would make sense if you were trying to use this mirror method. I find it hard to believe that someone, you know, an advanced civilization got on a craft, flew across the universe, and is responding to a signal from a mirror. However, right. a biological entity, you know, just like would fish, right, respond to you shine certain things in the water, just like use a method like that, something biological might respond to it, right? Right. And, and it's a good point. There's a, there's a, a famous book written by an Australian man. Um, uh, his mind slips me right now, but that's what he called them sky critters. And he believed that he was shooting with infrared film. Mm -hmm. So it had to be developed differently, um, black and white. And he was catching all these weird anomalies in the sky. And so he wrote this book, uh, oh, I can't remember his name, um, and called them sky critters and said that his whole theory was that they were, uh, you know, a biological thing. They lived in the sky. They evaded us all the time and stayed away from humans. Um, and we would catch them on film or, you know, randomly see them. Um, but yeah, that's that's there's a couple other researchers too that have gone along those those lines. Mm -hmm. You have another video on your website um, that shows a couple of Chinook helicopters flying over, which brings up the question: What do you think the government's role is in all of this? If there is, you know, what is is it more X Files where they're involved in a conspiracy? Are they covering things up because they just don't know what to do with it? Or so I've been told by um, somebody who's high up, uh, huge credibility, like I, I can't really say who it is because they don't really want their name used, but I communicate with this person all the time. Um, and what he told me is that the samples that they are now putting out the peer review about um there was a set of samples that would sit in a warehouse and they've had these for decades mm -hmm. and they kept taking them out running new science on them not getting anything putting it back yeah a couple of years later taking it back out running tests on it you know until they came into the modern era and now they have machinery that can right. and computers that can look at it. So um, the, uh, the whole thing with um, the government, first of all, I never believe what they say, never. They've lied about the smallest things in our right. lives. <laughs> right. You know, and this but there's is, different reasons behind lying. So, I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. Right, right. But right. sometimes, you know, it's lying because it's the government. And it's just what they do. They don't seem to, you know, but that doesn't, that's, it's a different thing if there's like a 
if you remember the old X Files series, you know, with the smoking man and the conspiracy behind it, blah blah blah. So that's, I guess, my question is: Do you lean towards thinking there might be some larger conspiracy going on involving the government, or is it just the government kind of is this stupid entity itself that tends to lie and because it doesn't know what to do or whatever? I, I think that the the uh, I think that over these years and these decades that this has been going on that they have looked at it as how can we apply this yeah to the military how can right. we get a hold of this technology right and how can we capitalize on it and they unfortunately haven't been able to but they don't want in the meantime it to fall into someone else's hands sure and the chinese to say okay we're going to find out what these ufo's are all about you know <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I think it's always been um, their MO to diffuse, right? you know, distort, um, you know, um, confuse. And so they feed stories out there and right. different things into the UFO community to try <laughs> to get people to, uh, you know, they're looking at, you know, people that... <laughs> are not even involved and have done like, you know, written some crazy book. Yeah. You know? um, but yeah, I think that they, they, uh, you know, and, and like you said, I think they may be in the dark about it. Yeah. That they may be, they probably have really incredible evidence. Yeah. I believe that they hold on to, you know, footage and, uh, you know, uh, trace evidence from different landing sites and, you know, different things. Right. I, I think that, but I think they're still confused by it. They're still yeah. trying to figure out what it is. You right. Know? And there's so many different agencies that it could be one agency has a piece and other agents and they each guard their own little pieces and, yeah, you know, and yeah. Um, I would, I do, if hopefully I'll remember, I do want to go over your brother's story. I know your brother doesn't isn't interested in the phenomenon, but that was an interesting part of it. Um, but before we do, I wanted to go over that article that you linked on your website from Nolan and Jack Filet. Because that to me, you know, I'm, I've never, bec I've, because I've never witnessed a UFO, uh, I've never seen evidence it's hard for me to point to evidence that says all right i'm i'm convinced you know i'm open-minded to it but it's other people's stories until i see it myself or unless i see hard evidence that was an interesting article that seemed pretty close to hard, to some hard evidence of something so i'm i have a couple of uh if it'll let me i guess it's, i don't know if it's gonna let me open this here i opened up the link all right um so just to tell the audience, so this guy, like Nolan, who is a cancer researcher, uh, I guess one of the top cancer researchers at Stanford University. He is. And was brought in, you know, was this 15, 20 years ago? There was um, Stephen Greer or somebody had found, gotten his hands on this little alien that was, I think it was <laughs> maybe... Um, yeah. a baby yeah. alien right it was really cool looking you know it's got a misshaped head and blah 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 right. it was i think it was a mummy and it was maybe from from latin america maybe 500 years old or something yeah, like that a child with some deformities yeah so they managed to get him to bring in to, to analyze it which which is good because most scientists wouldn't want to touch these things and he was able to show them this is not an alien it's a normal human being that has suffered mutations and deformities and illnesses and blah 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 so that that created some credibility for him so so then these government or semi-government related groups came back to him when with something different this time it was with these um uh strange metals that had some unusual isotopes to them that they had dripped off supposedly from craft mm -hmm. and so he had debunked the other one but this time he didn't really debunk it and he seems to be pretty open to the idea and he even goes into so he says, all right, what are the circumstances of this? I'm quoting from the article now. For instance, in some cases, the witnesses state that the observed objects appeared unstable or in some kind of distress. Then it spits out a bunch of stuff. 
Now the object appears it's stable and it moves off. It looks like it fixed itself. One hypothesis would be that the material it offloads is part of the mechanism the object uses for moving around. And when things get out of whack, the object has to unload it. So it just drops the stuff to the ground and that's what they, and that's what they found. Um, so that, and then I guess they looked at this and they, the, it's got very unusual altered isotope ratios um, that would not normally be found in nature or even in, a, in any man-made process. Man, humans could make it if they wanted to, but there'd be no reason to, is, is what he's kind of saying. So he's speculating here if it was part of some kind of an alien propulsion system, I think. I, I find that fascinating. Yeah, so these, uh, what they call ejection cases, um, there's the they're sprinkled throughout the literature over the years. There's been a bunch of different ones where people have seen something shooting out of it, dropping to the ground. Um, and in a few of these, they've retrieved samples. And um, Jacques Valli has been scouring the world for the last few years trying to get cases where there was an actual piece of you know something um there's actually a very famous one the name escapes me at the moment but uh it it squeezed out this it 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 looks like a like a giant drop uh almost like a a, a teardrop of, with a point on it where it looks like it was like extruded out of something. Hmm. Uh, it's good size. It's like, a, I believe it's almost a foot long. Um, wow. And there's a few of them. It's really strange. And they've retrieved some of these samples and done tests and found some really, really, that peer review, I've been talking about it for, I've been waiting for over a year for it to come out, probably a year and a half. And, uh, it finally came out and I believe there's more, there's going to be more uh, peer reviews coming from them. They're looking at all kinds of stuff that they've retrieved and uh, you know, some's from so-called crashes, some yes. from these ejection cases, um, you know, so it's kind of. How did you feel about the report? I, I thought it was awesome. I, uh, I've I've spoke to Gary many times and he is uh the guy is so freaking smart it's ridiculous. Oh, is that Nolan Gary? That's yes. Yeah, oh, you've yeah. spoken to him. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow, that's yeah. wow, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah I, it's, it's I, I speak to him on a regular basis in the private messages. Oh, wow. wow. We talk to each other and uh and he's just the guy's so smart and uh yeah. yeah. So and he's got balls too, because he's he's yeah, putting yeah. a lot on the line to go he from is, his cancer research is. into this. Yeah, yeah, and he's very well known in the cancer arena. Yeah, he's, he's written papers and been involved in books, and you know, just like he's he's the guy's got serious credibility, man. Yeah, and uh, you know, so he was uh, funded with a private funder. Uh, who gave him a lot of money, like millions yeah. of dollars, yeah. to build this machine. There's a video of it on YouTube. It's a short clip with him and Jacques in the lab. Mm -hmm. uh, they got a bunch of samples, and he's standing next to the machine. So this machine can analyze any material down to its atomic structure which they were never able to do before. And so he spent, I don't know, three years building this machine. And um, they're now able to put this metal in there and look at it and say, that's weird. Like we, yeah. didn't, we didn't make that. So who made that, you know? Um, you know, and, and just found all kinds of stuff. So it, he's, he's a very interesting man. It's funny too. Tell me, I don't know what you think. It just comes, this hits my mind now when you're talking about 
earlier how the possibility that these things could be biological, not craft. Right. You know, if that was if you had something that was biological that was made of something metallic, I guess if it was wounded, it could drip, right? Is that is that crazy or yes, I mean, you know, there there's uh there there's also the theory that um it's some kind of um AI. So yeah, like like in the Terminator 2, right? Right. So it's like half biological and half machine. Mm, yeah. And, it, and it's being sent here from somewhere else to look at us. That makes sense. You know, I mean, there's there's just so many theories out there and our science just doesn't begin to comprehend it yet. Because that even fits in with the known laws of physics that limit travel to the speed of light. If, if other life forms are at least remotely similar to ours in terms of lifespan, the speeds and, you know, the times involved would travel and would really tend to discourage anybody, any creature from wanting to explore very far into the universe. Right. Right. But if you were sending an AI to do it, that was like that, that would make a lot more sense. And look what we're doing. We're sending our own form of AI to Mars. Yeah out into the universe to take pictures i mean yeah. we're just getting started yeah. but somebody else may have got started a long time ago that's right that's right so uh what happened with your brother if you don't mind talking about that because i found that so, really interesting. yeah my brother uh during this time when we were children um he had uh he kept on having a couple reincurring dreams one of them was a giant praying mantis looking in the window and he would have this a bunch of times and and we would laugh about it growing up and then of course getting into the literature and people are describing like alien beings looking like giant praying mantises and right. you know that's sprinkled throughout the literature with people saying it was a mantis looking being um you know so i thought huh that's kind of weird that he you know and it didn't mean anything at the time and now years later it's like wait a minute you know is that connected i don't know can't say but um and then the second dream which was the more startling one was um he would come to the top of the stairs he would float down the stairs come around the corner he would see me in a chair hooked up to machinery with men around me with big heads yeah, that's really unusual. So I just so you're you how old how old is your brother compared to you? Uh he's two years younger. He's two years younger. So you were four when you had your disappearance, you're out your adventures in the woods and stuff. Yeah. How old was he when he had the dreams compared this, to that? This was um this was a few years later. So I was maybe six or seven. And or seven, was, okay. And he was five. Right. So if it was a related phenomena, if it, it, then it would have been something that was repeating or ongoing over at least a three-year period. Right. It's an interesting dream. You know, we have strange dreams, but you know, why would someone who was say four or five or six, which he was at the time, dream of you being hooked up to equipment? Like, where would a, a child <laughs> get that idea? You might get that idea now, if by right watching sci-fi but i don't know how much well it's how, it's how we form our ideas like for instance i'm a graphic designer and an artist yeah so my whole life my art has been influenced on what i can see what i can look at what i can figure out the shape of or and so that has a big influence on you know what you're looking at but being the age we were, there's no reference point. There's no, you know, well, he saw that in a monster movie. Well, not really. You know, we didn't, my mother didn't let us watch that stuff when I was that young, you know, it's yeah, just wasn't happening. Um, the part that's funny is for years we laughed about it because he said the only way he was to able to wake up was to one of the men with the big heads came and grabbed him 
and he would squeeze his face, the, the big headed guy's face as hard as he could. Yeah. And he would wake up. And so we would laugh about that. It was like kind of like a little private joke between me and my brother. And I think it kind of made him feel better at the time. But the wording of it and how I described it is his wording. Um, and again, was not relevant until the literature. And then I it's, it's, it's even like when you're that age, not only is the dream unusual, but being able to be able and willing to recount that a dream to other people. It, you don't usually hear a five-year-old kid talking about in detail about his dreams, I don't think. Yes. yes. And we, uh, you know, even years later, every so often, I'll bring it up to him. And he knows about the documentary. Um, he has no interest in the subject at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but you know could be a lot of reasons for that you know and 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 i've thought about that myself um but there's you know it will still joke about it every every so often it'll come up and um you know it's it's just strange i mean can i connect it probably not but yeah. is it uh similar to people having experiences yeah but, you know, I mean, you can speculate all day long and still there's no solid connection or, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know. Have, have you or anybody else in your family had other experiences with the paranormal ghosts or psychic yeah. or anything? Yeah, so um, uh, when my grandmother was small, she was maybe 12, I think. Uh, sitting at the kitchen table and this was like 19 1920s somewhere around there uh, she's sitting at the table she's coloring with you know a coloring book and um, this man walks into the dining room looks just like a man solid um, you know and he just stands there and smiles at her. So, of course, she gets scared because she's like, who the hell is this guy? You know, yeah. as soon as he senses that she's getting scared, he walks to the other side of the table to kind of get away from her. So as not to scare her yeah. and then stops and stands and smiles again and then opens the door and walks into the other room. So she runs out of the room crying, goes to her mother and uh, describes him. And so her mom, who was my great grandmother, uh, pulls out this photo album and flips through it. And she says, did the man look like any of these people? And she pointed at the picture and she said, yes, it looked like this man right here. And it was her uncle that had yeah. died a couple months before. Oh. And so she would tell this story. So for me, it's been knocks, things moving. Yeah. Um, one of the most recent incident, I shouldn't say recent, it's probably four years ago now. Um, I, something startled me awake in the middle of the night. So not waking up slowly, I, I, I woke up instantly, sat up in the bed, swung my legs over the side of the bed, stood up and started walking instantly towards the door for some reason. And as I did this, um, there was this large, dark shape in front of me moving away from me. So I thought, I'm thinking it's one of the kids, they're out of bed. And I get to the hallway and the shape of the window is being projected on the wall from the moon. So the shape of it is lit on the wall and this big, dark shaped thing moved in front of that and blocked it out just for a second as it passed and so now the hair stands up on my neck I'm like what the hell is what is this so I'm thinking one of the kids are out of bed they're having to go to the bathroom check on them both they're sound asleep so I went downstairs opened up all the doors turned on all the lights made sure everything was locked I, I thought somebody was in the house um nothing there huh. 
Um, so, you know, different things like that, noises. I'll be home, I'll be sitting in the living room, I'll be home alone. You'll hear the silverware rattle in the kitchen as if somebody's getting a fork out of the fork drawer. You know, there's nobody in there, there's nobody there. Um, things like that all the time, all the time. Well, let me let me go with one last question for you, Scott. And uh, I'll I'll make I'll kind of combine a couple of things into one long question. But so, you know, some people like that I've interviewed and are in our group, they really seem to have this very strong belief that aliens are beneficial. They're here to help us. Uh, they've helped humans throughout history. Uh, I think. I think a part of a lot of that seems to, you know, I have to be careful. I say this, but it seems to be emotional need. You know, this is almost like a new religion to some people. Yes. Um, but, you know, one of the guys in our group, Dave is a really smart guy and he's studied the history a lot. And he would say, well, if they were, they, you know, if they were here to abuse us, they have the technology to do that. They're far in advance of us. So they would have, and uh, there'd be evidence of that. So I'm just, curious a if you think beneficial we've already kind of talked about this a little bit are, are they possibly manipulating is it is there a, an agenda that's neither beneficial or it's just kind of their own agenda and then just finally as as the final personal side of that question you know you are de you definitely are at least strongly suspicious that something happened to you twice when you were a boy and possibly more than that, if you consider what went on your brother's dream and that you've had incidents that have would knocking and things that have come going on in your life. Do you experience any fear about any of this or anxiety or, you know, that, that these aren't these, these things aren't here to help me. And I just, so, so part A of the question was, do you think that is, are they malicious, beneficial, something in between, and then part B was, do you feel any anxiety or fear yourself about any of that? In your I think that uh, the, I think that it goes both ways. First of all, I think the phenomena is probably made up of more than one thing. That it's not all the same thing. Mm -hmm. But um, the part that I don't like about the phenomena that makes me suspicious of it is its covertness. Yeah, deceptiveness. Yeah. Yes, and, and it's trying to hide itself all the time. Yeah. That, that leaves me a little bit with a creepy kind of feeling, yeah. you know, like, yeah. why is it doing that? Yeah. Um, you know, and you've always got your guy that's going to come out and say, well, why don't they land on the White House front lawn? And, you know, that's just never going to happen. But, um, you know, I think that, in certain cases, it's had like really beneficial uh, uh, effects happen on people who have experienced it. And then there's other cases that are just absolutely terrifying that have yeah. left people with PTSD, um, you know, so I'm kind of torn between it all being the same thing. I think elements of it are not good. And then it's shown elements of itself that seem to be good or seem to be beneficial. Yeah. But can we lump it all in together? We really can't because we don't know. It could be a different things interacting with us. Right. Um, and even Jacques Vallée and some of his theories, you know, relating these phenomena to fairy encounters and things yes. like that back in the medieval ages, where the there's you know the fairies could be both malicious and beneficial too depending on right. their reaction to what you were doing and there was also a big trickster element to some of the stuff that they they do right and the trickster runs through like different cultures uh different cultures have different names for it but it kind of does the same thing it like messes with people and you know so i mean i'm not really sure I mean, I'm yeah. still on the fence with the whole thing. I don't know if it's good for us or bad for us, or it's, you know, maybe one, guy, maybe one kind is good for us and another kind isn't. Right, I, right. I, what, what about the kind in your life? Does that create any fear, anxiety? Do you, 
you know it does you know it there's been times where i've been super scared like it's like i've seen things that have scared the shit out of me like the thing in the hallway you know the all the hair was standing up on my neck i was like you know what the f is this you know why is it in front of me in the hallway why is it moving what am i doing while i'm you know i'm following it like i just you know um and then there's been other times where i've seen things where i've just been completely mesmerized by it you know and yeah. look at it going trying to rationalize rationalize what is it what is it you know is it it you know have i seen this before and um you know, so I'm I'm just kind of like, it's both. Yeah, it's both. Have you ever looked into joining MUFON or any of the? Uh, I was a I was a MUFON investigator in the '90s. How come and, you left? Or is, I'm 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 not that familiar with what they do, anyways. But yeah, so they're the biggest civilian UFO network. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, I guess you could say yeah, the biggest and the longest running. They've been around since the mid to late sixties, I believe. Uh, and they record cases. So, um, um, I can't say who this is right now, but I'll give you a little bit of an exclusive. Um, I'm working with somebody from television. Um, and I'm resurrecting a case, the, the case that broke me away from MUFON that made me leave MUFON and form in the field. Oh. So this case was, I get an email one day, I'm a brand new investigator. I had only investigated one case in my area. We tracked it down. It turned out to be a blimp uh, passing over at two o'clock in the morning. People saw it, they were freaked out, uh, but we found it, we tracked it down. So this case was, I get an email and they're like, you know, explaining in the email, it's a crop circle, but it's in corn, which is really rare. It does happen. And you can find certain cases of it kind of sprinkled throughout. But again, with hoaxers, it's very tough to hoax a circle in corn. It's not the same thing as the wheat or the rye. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I get this email, it's a mile from my house. So I'm thinking, okay, this is a bunch of kids. They get this happened at the same time as the blimp sighting. Uh, somewhat after it. Okay, uh, all right. Probably I don't know, a few months later. So it's not connected to it in any way. No, right. not at all. Okay. So, uh, long story short, I go there. The the little old lady and a little old man. They ran a vegetable stand. They sold flowers awesome people they're they're known locally around here um he brings me out to the cornfield and there's the circle now he embedded a flower bed into the corn so his wife could grow her prize flowers different kinds probably 50 feet long the circle was exactly at the end of the flower bed okay yeah in the corn yeah so I got down on my hands and knees and I crawled around this circle and this disturbed soil. I'm thinking I'm going to get a sneaker print. I'm going to get some kid's shoe. Nothing. There was nothing. So now I start looking at the stocks and on the outside of the circle, it was like as if somebody would take a ballpoint pen and heat it and then bend it in a curve. Mm -hmm. So the corn on the outer rim of the circle was coming up out of the ground, about an inch and a half, and then curved out like a bull, as if it had grown around something. And so I started snapping pictures of this corn because it was completely irregular. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that does that to corn that would do that in one night. Mm -hmm. So long story short um four separate houses witnessed a light that night the fourth house up was a palmer police officer him and his wife witnessed it from their deck coming down through the trees mm -hmm. and then the next day the circle was there 
um, if you were to take these stocks and pick them up and try to like, maybe try to get a curve to them, yeah, they would just crack and break. They were yeah. like at the point of harvest. And so, you know, he had farmers coming from other areas to look at it because they were so <laughs> fascinated by it. I mean, it, it was, so anyways, I am resurrecting this case and have revisited these witnesses over the last two weeks because this television show is interested in doing a segment on this. This is why you left MUFON or that's what no. the story So I left MUFON because I took all the photos, did all the interviews, um, took tons of notes. Uh, everything was mailed to my upper, the person who was above me, who was already a, a, a um, investigator. I was a trainee. I was coming up to be an investigator. When, after this stuff was submitted, I tried to get feedback about the case, you know, the samples that were taken of the stocks, the dirt. I couldn't get anything. So over the years, I've connected with different people in MUFON. And just recently, somebody who's kind of high up there and asked him, can you get me a copy of this report? I want to see this paperwork that was done on this. Nope, nobody can get me nothing. So um, I contacted the original investigator, uh, just spoke to him on the phone last week he is going to he's supposed to get me copies of everything that he took down all of his notes um so the reason that i left mufon was because i i began to see things in the organization that i didn't like you know i kept trying to get this feedback you know for us it's all voluntary we go there on our own time we volunteer our own time we we put in this information and I just couldn't get any feedback from these people. And I thought, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to go do my own thing. Right. And that was sort of one of the things that kind of moved me towards creating in the field. So you think it's more just a bureaucratic problem within MUFON? They're not well organized enough or. I think that MUFON needs to completely gut their whole structure and start over so in my eyes i have been wanting and talking to people i don't have the money or the time to even try to pull it off but uh to have a searchable database with cases by year by name with everything pros and cons of a certain case and you're able to look it up and study it. Move on. They really don't have that. They don't have a yeah. database. They don't, you know, there needs to be a place for researchers to go to, to try to uh, yeah. track things. And, and, you know, they, they take in a good, they take in a good amount of money. I mean, yeah. So what do they do with it? I it's, it pays the board of directors and, they put out this little black and white newsletter that comes in the mail every month. And, you know, I don't know. I, do they I have training or anything like that? Do they... they do. You have a booklet that you get to train for their test. They give you the test. If you pass, you start out as, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, tr investigator trainee, then move up to investigator. And then you can move up to like, uh, you know, regional, whatever, they have all these different levels. And so, you know. So they have a system in place, but what they don't seem to have is a central administration for the data and the files and, and all that stuff. It really could be a much better organization if they got that all together. It really would yeah. be. So yeah, maybe, maybe they should get Joe Rogan in there to, to back that up, put the, <laughs> fund it a little bit and put some put some pressure on him to get it together. Well, all right, man. This, this was um, a great interview. I really uh, went to some places I didn't expect, uh, Scott. So thank you very much for your time. Is there anything you wanted to ask me before I uh, end it? Or anything you want to oh, go you, or anything you want, else you want to say? So, um, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, if, um, if people are uh, 
you know, curious as to more about in the field, um, they can go and pick up uh, Diana Pasolka's book, uh, American Cosmic. Um, and uh, so, I'll, well, I'll tell I'll tell that little bit of story as as we'll go off the show. Uh, so she asked to join in the field. I didn't know who she was, but she said her favorite researcher was Dr. Jacques Vallee. So of course, I'm a huge Vallee guy. I'm I consider myself a student of Vallee. Um, so I said sure. So I let her in. I didn't know who she was. A couple months go by, and my buddy says, you know. You don't know who that is? And I said, no. So he said, look her up. So I Googled her, uh, professor of religion at North Carolina University. Um, she was the chairman of the department for a long time, um, very respected at the university. So I thought, you know, automatically she's joining a UFO group. She's probably looking at the parallels between religious sightings and yes. UFOs, you know, and yeah. so that was my automatic connection in my mind. Right. Um, so she, uh, she, we, we began to talk in the private messages and, you know, she'd ask me questions and different things. And then one day she said, I'm writing a book and I want to feature you in the book. And I was like, holy shit, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm honored, you know? So um, we made a date she flew out here um, from North Carolina to Massachusetts. And if you ever get a chance to read this book, there's two scientists in the book that are under pseudonyms mm -hmm. because they're very important. And so they didn't want to go by their real names. Um, I made reservations at a restaurant. She shows up and she walks in with this man. So she, they sit down, she introduced, you know, how are you? How's it going? And she says, this is Tyler, which is the name he goes by in the book. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you his real name because he's working on classified projects. Mm -hmm. So now I'm looking around the restaurant, right? Thinking I'm being, so you knew who he was. No. Oh, you didn't know at that time. All right. No. Okay. So I'm looking around the restaurant like I'm being punked, like yeah. this is not happening, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, so we order our meal and we're talking and, um, you know, he tells me that he saw some of my graphic work online and he would love to, um, you know, uh, have me do some graphic work for one of his companies. So he hands me his phone and says, here, put your put your number in my phone. So when I do, there's his name at the top of the screen. So I punch my name in my number, give it back to him. We go throughout the day and we part ways at the end of the day, we visited a couple coffee shops and we were all around. We part for the day and I'm driving home and I'm like, okay, this is bugging the crap out of me. I pulled over started googling his name and she told me ahead of time when she introduced him she said if you do eventually discover who he is you will find almost virtually nothing about him so i thought oh that's weird too <laughs> so uh i pull over sure enough i google the name it pulls up pictures of him very few though I think there's maybe five online, if that. Mm -hmm. um, so this person uh, is is in the book. Uh, he multimillionaire. Um, has dozens of patents on scientific inventions. Mm -hmm. A lot that he's made for the the medical industry. Mm -hmm. um, and uh so would you consider her a believer in the phenomena was she studying the phenomena or studying the people in the field like you she's, she's studying belief okay so so she's studying she, you and yes yes she began yeah. to see 
I said, when I first got to the restaurant, I said, okay, first I'm going to ask you straight up. Why me? Why did you pick me? Because I had barely a reputation in ufology. Not a lot of, I mean, some people knew who I was and I interacted with some well-known researchers, but I wasn't that well-known. And she said, because I saw what you do and I trust you. Mm -hmm. So we, that's one of the reasons why we begin to correspond. And um, I, I don't think, she's never really said if she's a believer. She says she believes that in the book, she goes into one woman who became uh, not a saint. Um, it's a famous incident where this sister uh, was um, visited by this little short being who had this sharp instrument and would pierce her abdomen mm -hmm. this this is a famous religious not fatima right no no okay uh uh she became revered later on years later after she passed away she's been written about a bunch of times mm -hmm. and she told me about the original translation of this incident and that it sounded just like modern day abduction, but it was an old religious text. And so these things began to intrigue her. And this is how she began to go, right. wait a minute, this is the same thing, you know? Yeah, like Jack Valet seeing similar things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so interesting. It was an interesting time. So if people want to know about more about it in the field, um, they can pick that book up, American Cosmic. Um, it's a very fascinating book. I am probably the least fascinating part about it. Um, there is some seriously amazing stuff in there. And uh, you Are know, you still in touch with her? Yeah, I just did a podcast with her. I co-host a show with Erica Lukes every Friday night called UFO Classified. Mm -hmm. um, we just had Diana, Diana on three weeks ago. So me, her, myself, and Erica, and we did the whole two-hour episode, and um, you can find it or I can send it to you. But sure, fa fascinating woman, very yeah, sweet. Sound, definitely sounds like it. Well, if she's ever, I, I my channel has a very very small following right now. So, but if she ever wants to come on, I'd welcome her to come on with you or however she wanted to do it. Um, you can keep that in mind. Okay. So I guess we'll um, we'll wrap this up here. <laughs>